Thank you for that. That is a fabulous reminder of uh, both our, our Presbyterian legacy with Mr. Rogers, who was an ordained Presbyterian minister, but also just always wanting to be our neighbor. That was beautiful. Well, good morning. Welcome to Northminster Presbyterian Church. Um, fabulous for all of you who are here in person with us today, all of you who are joining us on Zoom, uh, and those who will check in with us later over YouTube, which is always, uh, you know, between five and ten people each week, which is pretty cool. So um, we do have some announcements before we get going this morning. Um, the first that I wanted to share is you may have noticed as you were coming in that there is now a beautiful bench out in front on the corner. Um, it is this church's uh, memorial to Sheila Stregel, who was our fabulous gardener. Um, and just this past week, Lars and Erica installed that for us. So we are going to have a dedication um, to her and to the bench uh, on December 12th, immediately following service. So um, that will be a great day to join us and be able to celebrate Sheila. Uh, we also wanted to let you all know that next Saturday, uh, we will be joining together here in the sanctuary um, at say 10, 10.30 um, to clean the sanctuary and get it decorated for Advent because Advent starts next week. I'm sh not to panic you all, but Christmas is coming. <laughs> Uh, and then if you didn't um, receive it yet, hopefully you uh, will be receiving our newsletter. If you didn't get it yesterday, hopefully you'll get it on Monday. We do have a couple of hard copies in the back and it is posted to our website. On the main page, if you go all the way down to the bottom, there's a little button that says newsletter. And if you click that, it'll take you to um, all the different newsletters that we have and you can read the most current one. So if you, whether you want it electronically or paper version, we have both. Um, if you didn't receive it in the mail and you want to receive it in the mail, then definitely um, send us an email at the info at northminsterpres.org account. Um, that is our main account for our office manager and we'll get you added to our mailing list. Are there any other announcements? I ask that as if I don't know the answer to that question. I know there are. <laughs> so go ahead and go on. So as some of you may know, we've restarted our Bible study, and I will be leading Bible study tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. in the library, and we will be looking at the scripture text for next Sunday, a fun kind of apocalyptic text in Mark that I think will be great to dig into. So I um, would love to see you at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Please join me in our call to worship. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to God with songs of praise. In God's hands are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains. The sea belongs to God and the dry land which God's hands have formed. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, for Jesus is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of God's hands. Christ, the first and last, no one works like him. 
Jesus Christ, the first and last, no one works like he. Let's join together in the prayer of confession printed in our bulletin. Righteous God, you have crowned Jesus Christ as Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him and are slow to acknowledge his will in our lives. We give allegiance to the powers of the world and fail to be governed by justice and love. In your mercy, forgive us. Raise us to acclaim Jesus as ruler of all, that we may be faithful disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, now is the time where we do our passing of the peace. And just a reminder, if you haven't been through it in person, um, I'll give the sign of peace. You all will have an opportunity to um, share the peace with one another. And then I'll call you back together by sharing the messages of peace that come into us over Zoom. And that's how we'll, we'll wrap up. So may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please turn to one another and exchange a sign of peace. So we have blessings of peace to everyone from Julia, peace to all from Lori, God's peace and love to all from Charlotte, 
peace and healing for the world from, it says Tabas, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, peace of Christ from Valencia and Martin. Thank you, everyone. And let us pray. O oh God most high, everlasting Lord, mighty and lifted up, grant to us your Holy Spirit that in these words of thy holy scripture, our hearts might be lifted up and our minds set on heavenly realities, that contemplating the reign of our ascended Lord, we may long to be with him and enter into the joy of his eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Our first lesson this morning comes from Daniel. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and kingship and glory that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. The word of the Lord. Well, thank you so much. That's so beautiful. It's nice to be able to hear a choir sound after so long. So thank you, really. Warm, feels very warm. So I was just reflecting on this past week as I was thinking about the Children's Corner uh, for today. And um, as I was thinking about how I felt this past week, I had a lot of uh, feelings of dissatisfaction, and I was thinking about them. I have some relationships in my life that I feel a little dissatisfied in. 
and Elliot and I are fine, don't worry. But I mean, <laughs> I was thinking about some other relationships in my life. And I'm like, huh, I don't, I don't really like where that is right now. Or I was thinking about just the state of our world. And I'm like, hmm, I feel a little bit dissatisfied with how certain things are going. And I was thinking about moments uh, at church where I'm like, oh, I wish we could take the masks off, or we could wish we could do this, or I wish we could do this. And uh, I was in this kind of weird place. And then I ran across this idea that I thought was really helpful. I think it'll be helpful for everyone, kids included and adults, to help us sort of navigate spaces of dissatisfaction. So I'm gonna use kind of a fancy adult word and then I will kind of explain it. So I ran across this concept that in psychology they call the locus of control. And essentially to kind of make that accessible, what it means is that when we look at our lives, sometimes we think that everything outside of us, everything external controls what happens to us. So that would be called something like the external locus of control, the place where we think everything happens to us, that we don't have any control, and that can be really hard. Or we can also think about our lives in sort of an internal way, that things that happen to us are within some spaces of control for us. And what I learned in the field of psychology is that when people feel on the inside like they can find things that they are in control of, they can feel better. And that doesn't mean that uh, you can control everything because obviously you take one, you don't even have to step outside your door to learn that you, you're not in control. <laughs> but I learned that if you um, are able to think about your life in terms of what you can control, Psychology tells us that we start to feel better, that we are less prone to feel sad or to feel anxious or to feel stressed. So I was thinking about this in context of this week, and it really wasn't even Thanksgiving, to be honest, even though that's coming. But I started thinking about ways in which I could feel like in my own internal world, like I had a little bit of control. And I started thinking, how might I do that? And Elliot and I were sitting at the breakfast table this morning, and he told me about another concept that we might know called gratitude. And I kind of laughed at him because I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. Like, that's, you know, like, of course, it's Thanksgiving. You're going to tell me gratitude, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, thank you. Um, but uh, I did a little Googling this morning, and I've heard about this before, and it's called the Happiness Lab. And it is this... Uh, project that helps people think about gratitude and how they can express gratitude in their lives. And that actually helps us as people um, learn to sort of practice these certain things to lead us towards a happier life. And so I thought, as we're sort of anticipating a season where we're going to hear that over and over and over, like, what are you grateful for? What are you thankful for? All this stuff, that what are the things that um, can turn our sort of mental narratives and stories that we tell ourselves so that we can find the little pockets of things that feel good to us. So that is my challenge to us this week is where do we find the little pockets of gratitude? They don't have to be big. They don't have to erase all the hard stuff because Lord knows like there's a lot to erase, but I think it can be a great way for us to think about how to reframe some really hard experiences in our lives. So I challenge you to do that this week. So let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you that uh, you are with us in the midst of um, so many different types of experiences, uh, times when we feel unhappy, times that we feel grateful, times that we're stressed, uh, times where we don't know what to do, uh, that we have the tools to navigate those experiences. So we thank you for that. Thank you, Zach. We are sort of in a weird space right now because we do have a lot going on. It's Christ the King Sunday, Thanksgiving is coming up, we have Advent next week. We'll get into all of that a little bit, but sometimes at this time of year it seems, does seem like all the things are just sort of crashing in at once. Well, our um, 
Our scripture reading today, our second lesson, comes to us from the Gospel of John, starting in chapter 18 with verse 33. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again and summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The prophesied, the chosen one, the one true king. A lowly, ordinary, and unremarkable person who was born to unfortunate circumstances, but seems to have the personal temerity to become a great leader when the job is thrust upon them, usually in their moment of greatest self-doubt, and then goes on to achieve a massive victory over their oppressors. As a theme in fable, mythology, and story across time, Hercules, King Arthur, Buffy Summers, Harry Potter, Anakin Skywalker. Though Darth Vader got to his prophecy through mass genocide, so that was a rather dark turn for George Lucas to take. But this sort of hero's journey story is something that we love because most of us see ourselves in it. We are also ordinary and unremarkable. We see ourselves as the hero. Neil Gaiman paraphrased G.K. Chesterton when he wrote in Coraline, fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. Heroes' stories lift us up and we have been inspired to write them and read them since we could put ink to parchment. And it is because we love this trope so much that those who seek evidence that Jesus was not divine will point out that like so many of the stories of legend, the story of Jesus is simply just another version of the hero's journey. An incredibly popular mythology, but a mythology nonetheless. So I thought I would take today, Christ the King Sunday, which is the last day of our liturgical year, to deconstruct the story a little bit. After all, every year we retell this story from its beginning, starting with the first Sunday of Advent. That's the first day of our new year. And it begins with this time of prologue before the birth of our main character. The story starts out very promising, a baby, presents, angels popping around, making proclamations. And we watch in awe as Jesus grows and does some really cool things and says even more impressive things. And then we get to that moment where all seems lost. Jesus is killed and everything is terrible for a few days, but then he's back. Joy and redemption, hallelujah. And then we have this period of time where now that Jesus has conquered our biggest enemy, death itself, we have this long period of time between Easter and today that if this was a real novel, might seem to sort of drone on like Tolkien taking 85 pages to describe the rolling hills of Middle Earth. It's a creative story, but he spends way too much time talking about trees. 
This long period is what we call ordinary time in our liturgical calendar, but it's where the meat of our story exists. It is in this ordinary time that we learn what it means to follow the hero's journey ourselves, where the lessons of Jesus hit home. And while it might not make for a gripping novel, it does make for very loving and justice-oriented faith, where the central message is the one that we have been hammering home for these past couple of weeks, that we are to love God and love one another. And now we have come to the end of our story, which in the best-selling novel is when the hero cements his leadership and carries his people forward in triumph and peace. And believe it or not, that's where our story ends too. But like those who want to dismiss it as a fable, we can sometimes misunderstand what that means. We call this Sunday Christ the King or Reign of Christ, both are used. But what do we mean by that? After all, Jesus didn't lead troops into battle. He didn't finish out his days sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. If he had, you probably would know absolutely nothing about him today. See, in our scriptures today, this almost casual conversation between Pontius Pilate and Jesus demonstrates this wide chasm between the human understanding of king and kingdom and Jesus's divine understanding. In this conversation, Jesus is both obfuscating and revealing. As a Roman governor, Pilate's ability to envision anything beyond his own political power is very limited. And at first, Jesus doesn't even seem to want to bother engaging him in it. He's being questioned by the highest authority in the land, treated like a common criminal, and he responds with avoidance and distraction. And we know because we have seen him exert way more effort to explain all of these divine concepts to his disciples and the people that he meets that he could take some effort at teaching or even evangelizing to Pilate but he doesn't do that. Instead, he offers this sort of cryptic and kind of confusing metaphysical argument that he is a king, but not a king of this world and some other world and that he came into our world to bring us truth. And all of that goes over Pilate's head. But for those of us who read science fiction and fantasy, we're all in, right? Alternate dimensions, space aliens, ooh, magical land with witches and wardrobes, yes, please. And as much as our creative fantasies might come alive at whatever possibilities we're trying to put into Jesus's words, Jesus wasn't any of those things. He was fully human. He was also fully divine. And that meant that he both completely understood what Pilate was asking, and he could have stopped everything that was about to happen by simply asking someone, anyone, to prove the charges against him. That's Pilate's dilemma in John here. The allegations that are being brought against Jesus aren't even allegations that Rome would normally execute someone for. And as it stood, there wasn't any evidence. And instead, Jesus proclaims himself the teller of truth. And in scripture, it's written with a small T. But when Jesus speaks, it's definitely a capital letter. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. But Christ, the truth Sunday has never really caught on. And reign of truth really isn't that much better. 
and it doesn't really get at what the early cultivators of our faith were after. Even if Jesus hadn't come to be the conquering hero, that's the trope we want to place him in because that's what we know. Even now, we struggle with what it means to have and wield power and privilege, both as individuals and as a community. Can anyone truly have power and be just at the same time? And that makes me wonder a little if the reason Jesus declared his kingdom to not be of this world is because he knew we would always struggle to bring political power structures and justice together the same way Pilate struggled with it that in order for us to imagine the life that Jesus knew we could have we would first need to be able to envision it happening somewhere else because i do believe that jesus knew we were capable of creating and li living in a world where love was what guided us that's the primary reason for the incarnation sometimes we talk about god made flesh as if God becoming human was so that God could experience what it was to be like us, as though it was God who needed to be empathetic to the human existence. But it makes much more sense to me that it was we who needed to be shown that we could live the life that Jesus described because he lived it. In living his human life, Jesus not only proclaimed the truth in word and in his lived existence, but that those of us who belong to that truth, who belong to love, we who feel that intimate longing of God deep within our souls, that we would listen to that voice. And we can still hear it. That's what allows us to comprehend the complexity of a world in which we find ourselves and in the world that will be but is not yet. Jesus is both of this world and not of this world. Yet we can still hear his voice. Now earlier I made a reference to C.S. Lewis and Narnia. And while some have presumed that Lewis was writing what we call Christian allegory, he wasn't. He was creating a multiverse. Lewis was a prolific writer of letters, and he answered every correspondence ever sent to him, especially letters written by children. And this is his response to a letter sent to him by a fifth grade class. I did not say to myself, let us represent Jesus as he really is in our world by a lion in Narnia. I said, let us suppose that there were a land like Narnia and that the son of God, as he became a man in our world, became a lion there. And then imagine what would happen. If you think about it, you will see that it is quite a different thing. So the answer to your first two questions is that reap a cheap and nick a brick don't, in that sense, represent anyone. But of course, anyone in our world who devotes their life to seeking heaven will be like reap a cheap. And anyone who wants some worldly thing so badly that he is ready to use wicked means to get it will likely behave like Nicobrick. I offer this up as sort of a final way to comprehend what Jesus is trying to explain to Pilate and 
through this scripture to us. That in a place where the structures of power are built upon love and compassion, mercy and justice, that is a place where Jesus would be king. But in a world where power is about control and exclusion, oppression and greed, that is a world that Jesus would never choose to rule. So, which kind of world are we willing to create? All who belong to the truth will hear its voice. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, the echoes of your truth reverberate in the depths of our souls. The call to love originates with you and we respond to it. Even as young children, we have sense of right and wrong, of justice and caring. And it is only over time as we age that we stop listening, that we let our fears, our worldly concerns like money and pain and greed. Those are the things that allow us to venture away. Those are also the things that allow us to proclaim you as a political king, as though the things that we want are what you want and that we can declare you as the reason for our sin. Help us to remember that you are a king of love, a king of truth, and that you are constantly calling us to create a kingdom that is based in those things. Help us to create that, to be that for one another. In your holy name, amen. Thank you.
Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, grant us the wisdom to be your church and to serve the world in all the ways that are needed. Help us to take our tithes and our offerings, both our financial resources as well as our human resources, to serve and love and care for our community and our world. In your holy name, amen. So as we come to our time of prayer of intercession, just a reminder that I'll pray for us corporately, and then we'll open it up to prayers um, from within the sanctuary, and then I'll conclude with prayers from um, those who are on Zoom, prayer requests there, and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. So please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we come together in a time of great turmoil. It is a time, both in our personal lives and in the life of our country, where we are continually reminded that justice is not yet, and that the kingdom that you call us to definitely is not the kingdom in power. Lord, we offer first some prayers to people within our congregation who are hurting. For Anne, who is going to need surgery on her back, we just offer all kinds of prayer and wisdom for the doctors that will be coming around her and help her to just have healing and to have a peaceful mind as she goes into this time. We also offer prayers of healing for our office manager, Judy, who was diagnosed with COVID last week, along with her son. It is a continual reminder that as much as we long to move past this pandemic, it is still with us. So we offer just prayers that they will be able to return to a full and active life soon. Lord, we also pray for our friend, Pat Curtis, whose son died this weekend. Be with her, surround her with people who can provide support and caring. Grant her the peace that only you can provide in this terrible time. And help us to continue to reach out to those around us, even those that we haven't seen in a long time those who are not able to rejoin us in the sanctuary, those to whom we feel some disconnect because we haven't been able to see them in person. Help us to remember them, to connect with them in spirit and over the phone and in letters so that we can maintain our ties to one another, even across separation. And Lord, we ask for a break from the constant, constant unnerving injustice that seems to surround us. That our legal system doesn't appear to be set up as truly justice for all. That the inequality that maps across our justice system based on the color of people's skin. That someone who doesn't kill anyone 
seems to end up dead by police and another one who doesn't have any business carrying a gun or trying to quell whatever sort of riot he envisioned isn't found guilty at all, even though he killed two people and shot another. It just seems so unfair and we, we've placed so much trust in our government and in our legal system and we believe that somehow it's going to all work out and yet time and time and time again it doesn't and we are tired. And even as tired as we are, it is nowhere close to how tired our friends of color are. Lord, it is in these moments that all we can do is raise a voice and ask and beg and plead that we can all find a new way to be. That we can learn to unpack our own biases and prejudices. And that we can continue to seek resolution that doesn't end at the barrel of a gun. And Lord, as we transition out of the close of this holy year, as we venture into a time of holiday celebrations, we ask for your grace and your mercy, especially for those whom gathering around family is difficult and problematic. That the times when we long to have it be opportunities of joy and connection that they can be times of conflict and the resurrection of old hurts. So Lord, we ask that your peace descend, that we are able to carry forth the memory that everyone is a beloved child and that even those that we disagree with are still loved by you. Help us to find our own moments of peace and to let go of hurts that we no longer need to carry. Help us to seek out those moments of gratitude. That when the weight of the world seems heaviest and the burden of our relationships seems overwhelming, that we can find those moments of pure joy and grace. Lord, at this time we offer up our prayers, knowing that you hear all things, whether they are spoken or not. Lord, we offer up prayers for the people who are dealing with the aftermath of flooding, especially our friends and neighbors to the north in Vancouver, where they are struggling to have pathways for food and water and medical care. We are reminded of the ravages of weather at this time of year. Help us to be generous and kind with one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in gratitude and grace, we come together offering the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, as I come to this table often,
I wonder why and what anchors me to this. Because it, it can feel rote and removed. What connects me and what connects us to an ancient, perhaps a distant story? As I think about that, I realize that as, as removed as we are, there are some connections. I think about the night that Jesus came to this table, and he came to the table during a time of serious social upheaval and unrest, when folks were asking if the institutions of the day were for them, when folks were deeply concerned and anxious about illnesses, diseases, seems a little bit similar. And also, Jesus came to the table knowing something very human, which is that eating together with friends was that relationships are the things that move us forward. So I, I just ask us to think about those similarities as well. For on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with his friends, and after giving thanks, he took bread, and he broke it, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, And after pouring it out, he said, this cup is the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For so often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes. Just a quick word of instruction again, if you haven't uh, seen these little cups, it's a bit of a different way than in tincture, which is when we would all rip the piece off and then dip it. Um, but you're gonna get a little cup and there's just this little plastic film on the top that you're gonna pull off and it's gonna have the wafer inside. You can take that in your own time. And then after you've taken it and you want to get to the cup, there's another sort of a uh, bigger tab here that's sort of purple, and we'll pull that off, and we will take the cup together when Jenny uh, comes back to pray after we've taken the wafer. So um, we will uh, come up, and you can process forward, and we will also walk towards folks who uh, don't uh, prefer to get up. But the gifts of God for the people of God.
cup of life. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, the gift of your nourishment is what sustains us across time and space. It's what sustains us in moments of unrest and of joy. Help us to remember the love that you provided us and to always hear your truth. Amen. Our final hymn today is in honor of Thanksgiving um, and it goes out as a dedication to Annika who was like, there's no Thanksgiving hymns. I'm like, yes, there are. <laughs> Your charge this week is to think of all of those spaces and places where Jesus can have reign and power out of love and justice, not only within your own life, but within your community, and be the one that helps inspire that truth. May the God of all creation bless you and keep you. May Jesus Christ make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Holy Spirit lift up her countenance upon you and bring you peace. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.